I think you'll hear me on the mic. Sweet. Uh, cool, everybody. My name's Tim. I work on Android at Yelp. And today, I'm here to talk about Multidex. For those of you who aren't familiar with Yelp, our mission is connect people with great local businesses. Uh, if you live in San Francisco, you know it's the best way to find businesses here. And if you're visiting, I highly recommend searching for burritos. Some quick stats about Yelp. As of Q4 of last year, we had 86 million unique monthly visitors. Uh, we have a total of 95 million reviews. 70% of our searches come from mobile, and we're present in 32 countries. Uh, also happy to announce that as of Thursday, we just crossed the 100 million review marker, which is super awesome. Uh, so I bring up these stats to uh, emphasize that Yelp is a mobile-focused company. So when we encounter something that might be a potential performance issue on mobile, we take it very seriously. All right, so what am I going to talk about today? Uh, I'm going to go over some background around multidexing and the topics surrounding it. I'm going to show you some performance data about what will happen to your app when you're multidexing at various method counts. Uh, go over an overview of what Multidex is doing, and we're going to look at the source code. And then we're going to do some experimentation around the performance issues we find to see if we can make improvements. So who's seen this error before? Like, raise your head, nod, face palm, whatever you want to do. What is it? I don't understand. It's broken my build. It's super frustrating. Uh, so what I want to say is, first, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. And next, uh, you're not alone. So here's some Google Analytics. Uh, Google Trends, rather, for searching for Multidex Android. If you're not familiar with Google Trends, it's like normalized search volume up to 100. That's why there's no y-axis. Uh, but you can see there's like a steady increase in interest in multidexing. And this reflects what we see when we look at blog posts and so on of, you know, my build won't work, and all this, like, the recent hype around this. So either you're multidexing already, you're going too soon. Like, it's just inevitable, really. So let's talk about Dalvik and Dex. Does anybody remember this phone? Anybody? OK, yeah, I thought so. Uh, now, I bring this up just to emphasize that the specs on some of the first phones that ship with Android were just super low. I mean, they were very high-end devices at the time, but compared to devices now, and even compared to servers and computers in general around the time, incredibly limited. So we're talking, for example, 64 megabytes of RAM. So when designing these systems, the Dalek VM, the bytecode, and so on, they were designed with performance in mind. Let's do a quick overview of the build process. I'm sure this is fair, like, fairly familiar for a lot of you, uh, but maybe I can teach some of you a thing or two. Uh, so if you come from Java development and other areas, you're very familiar with Java to class to jar and so on. Uh, and Android is relatively similar. You go from Java to class files, and that's where the similarities end. We go to a dex file. So why go to a dex file versus just using the regular jar format? And the answer is largely performance motivated. I'll talk about the specifics of the dex format in just a minute. But essentially, when you combine all the class files together, you can remove some of the redundancies that you have between them. Next, we put the classes, the dex file into a classes.dex, which is the name of your code, into an APK container, which is really just a zip, a zip file. So what happens to get the APK on the device? Well, it's different depending on Dalvik and Art. So on Dalvik, which again is API less than 21, first we copy the APK over the device. And that's where things like resources are accessed from in general. And a program called Dexop runs, which takes your class's Dex file and turns it into an optimized Dex file, or ODEX. And that's how your application is run later on. Uh, Dexop does a lot of things, but uh, the key word there is optimization. You're familiar with optimizations that happen at you know, Java compile time, maybe ProGuard optimizations. And this is relatively familiar. So uh, for example, it might do things like inlining certain calls. Or it might do things like, for example, if you have an empty constructor, it will replace that with a no-op instruction that's much more efficient. Really cool things. Now, Art is relatively different. So you may know that Art is ahead of time compiled versus Dalvik, which is most recently just in time compiled. So again, we copy the APK over to the device. But this ahead of time compilation happens at install time. So a program called dex to oat runs and takes your classes.dex file and turns it into native code. And what's really interesting here is that actually it will look for any classes files in your APK and turn them into the oat file as well. So we immediately see that if we're hitting a limit with dex files, on art, we can kind of get around this by just throwing a bunch of dex files at it, and it'll just deal with the problem. 
And on Dalvik, we have to deal, it, deal with it as a software patch. So which devices are Art and Dalvik? Like, does this even matter anymore? Uh, here's some recent stats from the Play Store console. And we see that you know, even though Lollipop has been out for, it came out in 2014, uh, it still doesn't really have the market share that we would hope. So if you're thinking about Dalvik and below, it still has the majority. And again, these stats reflect devices that have play services. And you can imagine that devices on the market that don't have play services in certain areas are probably reflective of the lower SDK versions. So this is a really important one thinking about multidexing in terms of where should my focus be? Is it OK to forget about Dalvik? Well, it's really not. So let's talk about the DEX file itself. So the first thing I want to point out is, you know, where does your code go? It's in this big data block. And that contains all of your instructions and so on. So the emphasis in the file format is removing redundancies, essentially. So basically, everywhere where you have the same string, we pull out the string, put it in this kind of pool of strings at the top, this blue container. And then everywhere that string was present, we replace it with an identifier. We do the same thing with types and methods and so on. And what I want to emphasize with strings is we're not just replacing like the, the primitive type of string, but a string could be reflective of a method name and so on. So you can see why this would be really uh, a really good optimization to have. Now, what's in the header file? So the header basically, because we want to jump around this file, we need to know things like where each, uh, each part is, so where the strings start and how long they are, or where the methods start and how long they are, and likewise with the data container. Uh, so I think um, some of you, I'm assuming, like the gears are turning, like where's the limit? Where's the method limit that we keep talking about? Uh, and the interesting part here is that the method limit is not here in terms of the, the identifier for method size. Like it's just a regular integer. It's not bounded to 65K. Uh, so where is this limit? Well, if we look at Dalvik bytecode, and this is just regular documentation you can find, uh, the instruction for invoking a method, in terms of the method reference index that it can take, it's actually 16 bits. So what's the largest in unsigned integer you can fit in 16 bits? 65K. And if you think about that from an optimization point of view, if we're trying to make the format smaller, what do we really gain if I go back here? What do we really gain if we change the size of the method, the integer for like the size of the method pool? we change that from 16 to 32 bits, we save 16 bits per file, right? Uh, whereas if we change how many bits for each method instruction, we can potentially save a lot more. So from an like optimization point of view, it makes sense for the restriction to be here. So we can put more than 65K methods into a DEX file, but we can't reference them. Uh, so that kind of sucks. And it leads to the question, like, why have such a low limit in the first place? Uh, and I'd really recommend that you check out Dan Bornstein's, the creator of Dalvik, his AMA with the San Francisco Android Group. He gives a lot of context around this problem. And essentially, you know, the marching order from the top down was, you know, make this as performant as possible uh, within reason. And given the kind of devices they were seeing and the size of the apps within uh, internally, which were the largest apps, they didn't anticipate hitting this limit. And we can all relate to this as programmers, like poorly anticipating uh, constraints for the future. But the next question is, you know, why hasn't this been fixed? Uh, so in relation to that, I'd like to bring up an analogous problem, which maybe you've run into. Uh, has anybody seen this error before? Yeah, OK. So what's going on here? This is really the analogous problem, but with strings. You have too many strings. They can't reference more of them. But do you remember, like, this is fixable, right? Like, what did you do? Uh, go to Stack Overflow, found some little thing you can copy paste into your build.gradle, set this flag, whatever this means, and all of a sudden your build works again. Sweet, but like, what did that actually do under the hood? When we look at the bytecode instruction set again for copying a string into a register, we see that there are two instructions, a regular one and then a jumbo one. And what's happened is that we've increased the size of the string reference. So we previously had this limit, and now it's much bigger, which is super awesome. Like, we had this problem. Google fixed it. This is great. But it leads back to the original question of, you know, like, why haven't we fixed this for methods? Uh, so I'm not affiliated with Google at all. So I can only just give you some things to consider around this. And the first thing I would say is that uh, art kind of solves this problem. Because we're going into native code, we don't really have this restriction. So 
potentially, you know, you could think of it as, you know, as more market share comes with art, uh, this problem kind of fades away. Another thing I would note is that a Dalvik fix, like patching the instruction set, would be an operating system patch. So why was this OK with the strings, like adding jumbo strings reference? Well, that's because that happened pre 1.0. Uh, nowadays, it would be much harder, you can imagine, to try to force an operating system patch onto all the many devices that are around, and also just in general getting different vendors to update. OK, so I still have this problem. How do we fix it? Well, spoilers, we ship multiple DEX files. Google has an official solution for this. It's pretty cool. It's really easy to do. In your build Gradle, you set some flag, you set some dependencies, and then you make your application extend multi-DEX application. Uh, before you just like put that in and just forget about the problem, I really highly recommend that you use this open source tool uh, to inspect your method to find out where your methods are coming from, expect your APK rather. So here's the uh, output for running this on the latest Yelp app in the Play Store. And the two things I want to highlight here are, you know, first at the top, the total method count, 73,000 for Yelp. We're using multi-dex. And the next one I want to highlight is the methods that belong to our package. So 30,000, roughly 40% of the entire, the entire method count. So as an example of why I think this would be really useful, uh, here's another app from the Play Store. I removed their package name. Top 100 app, I'm sure at least 50% of you have it installed. Uh, look at their top method count, 75,000. They're using multidex, but only 8,000 of their methods are actually in their package. Uh, so think about the downsides of this. Well, potentially they're including a dependency that they don't use at all. Their builds are getting much slower. Uh, potentially they're, uh, as we'll show later, they're increasing the runtime, the startup performance on everyone running their phone. Uh, the development time might be slower, and lots of other things. Uh, so I actually contacted this team to find out, uh, to let them know about this issue and help work through with a solution. And what they investigate, what they found out after investigation is that. They were ProGuarding, but they had whitelisted like, maybe like all of Google's code or the support app, support libs, et cetera. Um, and thankfully, with the next version of their app, they were able to get down to 40 or 50,000 methods, which is a big win for developers and users. And again, thinking about things like APK size, uh, there are real benefits all around to doing this. Maybe you don't even need to be doing multi-dexing at this point at all. OK, so I looked at my method counts, and uh, everything seemed fine. So can I just like forget about this problem now? Well, before you do, I want to uh, notify you about some performance issues that we found when investigating this. So when breaking things down into app start time, I want to talk about them in three categories. The first one being first start, when like literally the first time someone opens your app. Then cold start, when someone opens your app again after that, but it's uh, been open before. And warm starts, when your app is already in memory and people load it again. So a cold start, your app wouldn't be in memory. All right, so how do we even measure startup performance in the first place? There's lots of ways to do this. I'm going to tell you what I would recommend. And we can talk about it after the talk if you want, if you have other suggestions. So the place I would recommend starting is in a static initialization block on your application class. So think about the things that happen during app startup. Uh, for example, content provider initialization. Like, how do you capture that in a metric around your application startup? Well, when your application thread starts, your activity thread, rather, uh, your application class is loaded. And this causes the static initialization block to be run. So you can capture things like content provider initialization by starting your timer here. At the bottom of onCreate, you can lap your timer if you want to know just general application time, application startup time. And then I suggest stopping your timer in something like on resume of your first activity. Uh, you could go way more hardcore and stop it in like on draw of a custom view, uh, but I don't think that's necessary to get a good idea of uh, application startup time in general. All right, so see who can spot this error. Uh, we've got an app that's extending multidex application. We're thinking about multidex here. Uh, I think about the first place I know of to start my timer. I started it on create, and then I stop it on resume. And you can't say content provider because I already told you that, and that's cheating. All right, so we haven't looked at the source for multi application yet. But if you look at it, this is the entire source, by the way. 
the multidex on install, whatever that is, happens in attach based context. And maybe you know that attach based context happens before on create. So if you are measuring your startup performance like this uh, out in the wild or locally or whatever, however you were doing it, uh, you would totally miss the entire cost of multidexing. So I just want to emphasize this as uh, performance is hard. Think a lot about where you're starting and stopping your timer. All right, without further ado, here's the data. I'll break things down and go down line by line. So starting at 65K, when we're like right at the threshold of the limit, we just have constants for the start times. When we go 5,000 over, first start gets bumped by 30%. Cold start gets bumped by 2% and warm start stays the same. You can kind of think of why warm start wouldn't be affected at all, because your app is already in memory. Only thing that happens we know as developers is just activity on resume. When you get to 20,000 methods over the limit, this is when things really start to kick in. So 200% increase in first start time, and a 10% increase in cold start time. And lastly, warm starts are unaffected. So some clarifiers, clarifications on this data. This is for API 19. This is for the Yelp app, you know, starting at 65K methods, I just artificially inflated it with dependencies. And this is uh, the start and top times that, stop times that I mentioned earlier, so approximating user perceived uh, startup time. I'm not saying it's going to happen to everyone's app. Everyone's app is different and a special snowflake. Uh, but this is what happened with Yelp. This is a real example app. So looking at this data, immediately we're like, dang, this sucks. So let's talk about some conclusions around what we're seeing. The first start penalties were terrible. So 30% uh, when you're 5,000 methods, 5, methods over, and 200% when you're 20 methods over. Like That's really unacceptable when you think about the fact that these are the very first users using your app. Like They open up your app. The first impression is, dang, this is super slow. Like These are not the users that you want to be seeing this penalty. Next thing is that the cold start penalties were bad. It was a couple percent at 5,000 over and 10%. Uh, at 20,000 over. But those are potentially bearable, right? If you're a smaller team and you're not adding methods super fast, uh, it might be a good trade-off for you to say, well, there's a startup penalty, but I care more about features. And maybe uh, before this gets to be too much of an issue, I can set min SDK 21 and not worry about this. And lastly, I want to address like, something you'll see on a lot of forums around like Morty multidexing, whatever, I'll just throw in Guava or any other dependencies, or someone says, hey, throw in one more thing. Uh, and really what this data immediately refutes is just this entire idea. Like The method count still matters even after you cross the multidex boundary. OK, so let's dive into the source and find out what's going on so that we can figure out what's going on with the performance here. So here's a brief overview of what's going on with multidex. So we have our APK on the device. We remember at install time that we ran Dexop to, in, to set up an uh, optimized Dex file in our Dalva cache. When we start up our app, that's where our code is run from, the application optimized Dex file. What does Multidex do? We have these extra classes in our APK. How do we load those? Well, the first time you run Multidex, you know, again, as part of your application startup, it's code that's in your app. It goes into the APK and extracts these classes .dex, these additional classes .dex files and puts them in your application data directory. This needs to happen any time your APK changes. So you know, the first time your app is installed, yes. But it also needs to happen whenever your app is updated. right? So we have these extra classes files. How do we add them into our application? Well, the answer is pretty creative. And essentially what they do is uh, modify your class loader with the additional .dex files. But the VM restricts you to only running optimized Dex files. So these files have to go through Dexopt at runtime when your app starts. All right, so I'm going to start diving into some source code. And when the lens that I want you to look at this source code through is like from a performance perspective. Like, What's going on here that would be really bad? And remember that this is all happening on the main thread. So again, awesome thing about Android is I can just check out the source code and look at it. Uh, you may know that with Android Studio, you can like decompile libraries. And that's super awesome for when they're closed source. But if you do that, you're missing out on a lot of the awesome comments in the Android source code, as I'll show you, as I'll show you some examples. All right, so we saw a multidex application before. But again, just repeating it, uh, the entirety of this class is multidex install, whatever that is. All right, so jumping in, we immediately see that 
They're, <laughs> it's so rewarding to look at source code. A monkey patching, which is an amazing phrase, the context class loader in the, application, uh, in the application in order to load classes from more than one DEX file. This library works for platforms API 4 through 20, and it does totally no ops on newer versions of the platform, which provide built-in support for secondary DEXs. You know, as we mentioned before, because we're compiling to native code and because DEX to OAT recognizes all the DEX files in your application, you just don't have to worry about multi-DEXing. OK, so the method we called was install. We look here, it's roughly the same thing. It just patches the application context class loader by appending extra DEX files. It suggests that you call this in attach-based context as provided by the multi-DEX application class. OK, so here's the install method. I've ripped out a lot of things like logging and error checking and retries. And this is just kind of the meat of what's going on. So we'll go through this line by line. Starting at the top, you know, if the VM can already do multi-DEX, it just returns. And this is what we saw before with basically, is this lollipopper above? We do something, multi-DEX extractor.load. This is the step that corresponds to grabbing the DEX files that are in your application data directory. And maybe if they're not already there, we have to extract them out of the APK originally. Make sure they're valid. And then we do something that's like install secondary DEXs. OK, so let's look at install secondary DEXs. We see that it's doing a lot of different things depending on the SDK version. Let's dive. Let's, what is this really trying to do? Well, for those of you who are familiar with class loaders, or for those of you who are not, rather, it's essentially how Java loads classes. When you try to like, create a new class, it looks at the class loader and says, give me this class. So how does this work on Dalvik? Well, the class loader is the base DEX class loader, and it contains this field, the DEX path list which is kind of just a list of DEX files, as you might imagine. And it goes through each DEX file and says, do you have this class? Do you have this class? Do you have this class? And so on. Uh, so again, this particular DEX pathless class has a list of elements which represent DEX files. And so this is one of my favorite comments. <laughs> uh, they tried to rename this variable to a different thing, uh, but it broke the Facebook app, so they actually reverted it. Um, and if you look at the comment here, actually, you think about what we're trying to do overall, is we're trying to add entries to this file, uh, to this array, rather. But we look at this, like, the DEX path list is final, the elements is private, the class loader is, uh, has a private final DEX path list. So what you'll see in the multi-DEX support code is a lot of process around just reflection to make all this happen. So again, what we want to do is take whatever new DEX files we have, and somehow get them to be this DEX elements, be in this DEX elements array. And the way you make new element arrays, and again, the element class is just a wrapper around DEX files, is you have to call this method make DEX elements. And that is essentially a wrapper around doing things like DEX optimization, et cetera. OK, so we have an idea of what multi-DEX extractor.load is doing. What's next? Oh, yeah, sorry, here we go. Yeah, so we're jumping into load. OK, so what we're trying to do again here is look at the APK and pull out all of the additional DEX files. OK, so the first thing we have here is get zip CRC. Like, what does that even mean? Well, a CRC is cyclic redundancy check. It roughly corresponds to the hash of the APK. We just want some identifier to know if it's changed. OK, so we check you know, if the APK hasn't, modif hasn't been modified we can just load our existing extraction. So again, the step was APK extract the DEX files to data directory, and then we're going to load those. So if they haven't been modified from the APK, we can just use the ones that have already been extracted. If they have been modified, then we need to actually extract them out of the APK. And then we call a method called put stored APK info. And this just corresponds to storing the information about you know, the CRC of the APK. So we know next time, if the APK hasn't changed, that we don't have to do any additional work. And then we just return all the DEX files as a list. OK, so sorry, we looked at install secondary DEXs. We looked at multi-DEX extractor.load. And that's really the meat of what's going on here. So let's back out and look at an overview of everything that happened and think about this from a performance perspective again. So we know all the stuff on the bottom here is happening at runtime. So that should already scare you, because it's uh, what's one of the first pieces of advice you get as an Android developer or a UI developer? right? It's don't block the main thread, never block the main thread for anything. 
And not only are we doing all this on the main thread, right, because application attached-based context happens on the main thread, but we're doing a ton of I.O. We're extracting out these DEX files and so on. And we're calling this thing called DEXOPT, and who knows what that is doing or how long it takes. So when we look at this performance data again, you can see why this would be justifiable like in terms of what we're doing. Like This is a lot of I.O., something called DEXOPT. This really makes sense. But as developers, we're always thinking of ways that we can like weasel around the issues. So what can we do? I bet we can do something to reduce these performance concerns. So let's hack around and see what we can do. First question I want to pose is, could we do this work at a different time? Right, so whatever this work is that we're nebulously doing, uh, we know that it happens a lot more on the first load. Right? So the, the cold starts were reasonable to a certain extent, and the first starts were terrible. Uh, could we do this first start work at a different time in some way? Uh, it's kind of tricky because we want to do it at a different time, but we want to make sure it happens before the user starts the app. Uh, so what could we do? Well, here's a hint. So we can subscribe basically to this notification about when our application has been installed. So if you think about that, that sounds almost perfect, right? So the APK has changed. We can receive this and do our, our multi-dexing then. And then next time we start up, we don't have to do the first start. So let's try it out. Uh, adding an updated receiver is pretty straightforward. Uh, we just extend broadcast receiver, set it up in our manifest, make sure we're getting that intent filter. And actually, we don't have to put anything in our on receive, right? Because uh, our application class has to get created. And on attached based context, we call multi dex install. So really, we don't have to do anything here. So what happens when we do this? Like, did it work? Uh, and the answer, like, it totally works. It's, it's great. Uh, you can kind of eliminate that first, uh, that entire first column. Uh, unfortunately, like, the very, very first user, like, very first time you install, you still have to pay this penalty uh, because Android actually won't let you receive this broadcast until someone has opened your app at least once. And you can kind of understand why, uh, from a system perspective, they might want to do that. Uh, so huge win here in terms of every time you update, the users don't see this incredible penalty. Uh, but you do still get it for the very first users. So do this. There's, I really can't think of a reason not to do this. If you can think of one, talk to me afterwards. All right, so let's think about um, what's going on here is really we have all these dependencies in our app with multidex, and we're saying, like, load all these dependencies right now at startup, right? Uh, but do we need all these dependencies right now, right this very second? Uh, what if I'm feeling kind of lazy and I don't want to use all of them? So let's try that. What could we do here? So imagine we've got a library, like a foo class, and it has a method do bar. Uh, so let's take the library up top and let's dex it on our own. So we take the dex. You can dex it on your computer with a dex command. It's in the SDK. And the way we can use the library in our code without bringing it in is this provided keyword in Gradle. So it usually says compile, and we just change it to provided. You can use all the classes. It works. OK, so then how can we actually like, uh, load this additional dex file when we're running our app? Well, well, first we'll take the additional dex file and put it in assets. So we'll ship it, uh, but not in some place that'll get um, but just in assets, rather. OK, so we need some way to load this. So we'll make a separate loader for this, a foo loader. Uh, it knows where the dex file is. And we can actually just piggyback on the multidex methods. Uh, you have to change the visibility of this one, but you can do that. It's no big deal. Uh, and when you call load, we just use the install secondary indexes method. And that will bring in that library. And next, we need a, a wrapper around the foo class. And essentially, we can just delegate all the methods to it. So I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, the foo class and the foo methods are not in the main dex file. So like, what the heck is even going on there? Uh, and the answer is basically they get filled in with stubs. Like this class, you know that the foo class exists in the main dex file, and the do bar method exists. But if you try to call them, it'll error. So what we can do is using the foo loader, if we make sure that gets, ha that's get called beforehand, uh, all these methods will work. So what you can do is essentially add a checks and foo wrapper that ensure that the, the foo loader has been called. 
So the reason that you want this wrapper in the first place is basically so you can add those checks because uh, anyone could call uh, the foo methods anywhere and it would essentially break. So packaging it all together, again, we're shipping the foo library as an asset. And then in our class dex file, we have a loader and a wrapper for this library. So the interesting thing here is if you happen to fall in a nice situation where pulling out certain libraries can really pull you under the limit, you really don't have to deal with the startup cost at all. So I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, I ship apps that go on R2, and I don't really want to deal with like, having a whole separate branch for this. Like, How does this even work with art? Is there a way we can make it clean? The answer is basically, at some point, you just need to ensure that your foo library, instead of being in assets or whatever, just put it in the root directory and name it classes or class file. And then it'll get automatically loaded uh, when we call dex to out. So when you have your loader, if you're above Lollipop, you can just know up. Okay, so let's talk about this. This is kind of a tricky solution, and I wouldn't recommend it for most cases, actually. So a pro here is you can avoid the startup performance regression entirely. You also get a lot of flexibility about when and how to load the DEX file. right? So you, have, you can do whatever you want. right? So you could load it in a background thread. It doesn't have to be on the main thread. Um, but this could be a con if the user surprises you. right? So if they try to use code that needs to be loaded, and you haven't loaded it yet, you're potentially going to have to block them right there, which is arguably a bad user experience. Now, some cons here is that this is kind of fragile. right? So if somebody references one of the library classes somewhere else outside of your wrapper, then your app will essentially just break. Um, but you can maybe get around this with a lint check or it's check style, et cetera. There's a decent amount of boilerplate and process overall with setting this up. And lastly, like, it's kind of unclear how you would run ProGuard on this in terms of minimizing the size of the extra library that you're shipping. So what's a, when would this be useful to use? Well, if your app has like a very large dependency that is only used in an edge case, and your startup time is incredibly crucial, I think this could be a good fit. right? So for example, uh, with a Yelp app, we play videos, and we have a video library. Now, lots of users watch videos, but like, our home screen is not a video, and maybe uh, not everyone watches videos. So by pulling that out in this way, if we were right on the threshold, it might be worth it. Um, but ultimately, for our, our case, we decided that it wasn't worth the engineering overhead. OK, so these ideas both rule. right? So we've got uh, this, startup, um, this startup receiver, which kind of eliminates the first starts. And then we've got this labeling index, which is an entirely different idea, but can really uh, be a huge win for a lot of applications. Can we do even better than that? And so far, we've kind of treated the multi-index library as like a black box. Like, we'll use it, and we'll just work around uh, whatever issues it causes. Um, but let's profile and see if there's anything we can do uh, to get an even better win. So for those of you who haven't profiled, uh, it's super easy. Uh, I highly recommend you do it. And once you do it, I'm really excited for the next week of your life because I'm almost 100% positive that you'll find something in your app that's terrible and you can fix pretty easily. So these first two lines are how to start uh, creating a trace. So it's this android.os.debug class called start method tracing with the name of your trace file and stop method tracing when you want, uh, when you want the trace to be over. So put these roughly in the same place that you put your timers. Then to pull out the trace file, it's ADB pull. And then uh, once you get the trace file itself, you can just open it in Android Studio now, which is super great. OK. So I'm going to run a trace from the times we set up before to uh, you know, application stack and association to, let's say, end of on create for now, excluding activity for simplicity's sake. So here's, like, um, here's a graphic that approximates what that looks like. So, uh, in this case, this is, again, excluding activity startup for, an app, for the Yelp app when I inflate it to 20,000 over the limit and it reflects a first start. And the three categories here I've uh, labeled are dex extraction, the monkey patching part, and then your application startup. So when you look at this, it's a, like, you see how incredibly dominant the dex extraction part is. And you also realize that it's a little bit frustrating because the only part we control here technically is like application initialization, right? So, this dominating uh, force here is not something that we directly control. So uh, I'll, let me dive into the monkey patching part first. Oh, sorry, quickly. Um, 
from our knowledge of multidexing, if this is a first start, we get a rough idea that this is the cold start portion, right? So when we're doing a cold start, we've already extracted the dex, and we just need to do the monkey patching. OK, so here's what the monkey patching looks like. For anybody who's not familiar with looking at a trace, kind of the x-axis is time. Every time you make a sub call, it creates a new rectangle below you. So what we see here is like when you see this like case where each rectangle below is roughly the same width, what that means is that the entire call stack is dominated by the bottom method. In this case, it's dex file, open dex file native. And when you see something like this, it generally means from a performance perspective that you should be looking somewhere else. Like, if you have to call this method, then there's probably not much you can do to make things better. OK, so let's dive into the elephant in the room of like, what the heck is going on with dex extraction? Why is it so slow? OK, so here's a zoomed out view. Um, I've annotated the methods, and then at the bottom, it's kind of a reminder of the proportions here. And we immediately get like super confused because we see zip file init, uh, zip file read central directory. I don't know what that is. Um, why is it taking so much time? And actually, this tiny portion on the right here is the multidex extractor extract method. So that's the part that actually extracts. So what is going on the like, entirety of the rest of the time? So zip files. Imagine you have a zip file that contains a cat picture. A zip file contains a central directory that's a listing, basically, of all the files inside. Uh, and it'll say you know, the size of the file, the offset up for it, uh, whether or not it's compressed. So once you know the central directory, you can kind of jump in anywhere to start reading something. And if you look at the zip file class, uh, when you create the constructor, it immediately reads the central directory so that later on, when you want to access a file, you just try to access it, right? And the class that corresponds to each entry in the central directory is called a zip entry. Mm -hmm. All right, this is getting exciting. So below this read central directory line in the trace file, there's a ton of these tiny little method calls. So diving into them, uh, these are actually all zip entry constructors. And there's 4,000 of them. And that seems so bizarre. Like, why do we need all these? If you remember the purpose of this method in the first place, which is like, find me the extra dex files. And that was it. Uh, so where is this 4,000 number coming from? Uh, let me just quickly see how many files are in our APK in the first place. And then there's like the sinking realization as a developer, like, shoot, did we mess up? Did we do something bad? Uh, so I, again, APKs are public, so I grab other applications from the Play Store, check out how many files they have, and just like immediately relax. They all have like the same amount or more, so that's okay. Uh, and then we start to realize like why this might take so much time. So we didn't get a chance to dive into the perform extractions method before, uh, but let's dive into it now. So first, uh, we make a zip file representing the APK, and then we go through and try to get a dex file. And while we keep getting dex files, we uh, extract them, and then keep going. What's really interesting here from a performance perspective is that pretty much the entire cost of first star multidexing is like this casual constructor right here. The reason being for that is it's reading the entire central directory so that you can access any file in there. But again, looking at what's going on here is we don't really care about any of the other files. We only really care about, you know, in, in Yelp's case, like one file. It's just the additional dex file. So this seems like something we can improve, right? There's a lot of inefficiency here. OK, so we're reading the central directory. We have dex files in there. We don't know where they are. Let's just assume that they're grouped together, just for the purposes of hacking. So at some point, there's an end of the dex files. Like when you read a file that's not a dex file, you know you've read them all. So our regular pass just goes straight down. Um, that's the uh, vanilla zip file. What if we modified it to, once we see the end of the dex files, just stop? So that'll save us from reading any other parts of the central directory. Um, but where are dex files even in the APK? Like, I don't know. Uh, so take a look at the Yelp app. Um, I don't know if there's a, this is something you can necessarily rely on, but every time I build, the class files end up at the end. Uh, OK, dang, so we still don't get anything from this optimization. But what if I just move them to the top? Why not? So what happens when I do that? Well, the regular pass, again, goes all the way down. And our modified pass just needs to read a couple files. Uh, so when this loop on the left involves thousands and thousands of files, you might see an improvement here. 
So let's do a trace again and see what happens. So the top is the before and after this experiment, we see that like a dramatic reduction in what's going on with multidexing. And so why isn't this cost all the way brought down? Well, you remember that when we looked at the big trace file, there is significant but small portion of it that's the actual I.O. actually extracting out the DEX files. So that has to happen regardless. But the portion that we've cut down on is this huge inefficiency of reading the entire central directory. Again, huge win here, super awesome. Uh, are there any cons to doing this? Um, I, <laughs> it's kind of a hack, but I think that the concepts are essentially sound, right? So you can ship with just reading as much of the central directory as you can to get all the DEX files. Um, and if you don't find them, uh, you just read through the whole thing, like no big loss. So if you can get the opt extra optimization of reordering the APK, then you win and there's no downside. Next question is, can you use this in production? Uh, I think the concepts are essentially sound. Uh, there isn't a distributed way for you to do this right now, but stay tuned. All right, so uh, I've compiled a bunch of notes from this presentation, sources, things like that, other ideas for really cool experiments that I didn't have time to discuss today. You can get it at this GitHub link. It's not totally up yet, but it will be there soon. And that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, as a reminder, Yelp is always hiring. You can find us at any of these awesome links. I recommend the at Yelp Engineering one on Twitter. Uh, cool, so I'll be taking uh, longer questions. I'm happy to stick around and chat. I'm also happy to answer some shorter questions now. Uh, this is my contact info, and thanks, everybody. Shorter questions? Yeah, what's up? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how it would work if there are resources involved. Uh, like if you have an AAR file that has resources, but yeah, you have to manually extract it. What's up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So for like build times. The question, is that right? Yeah, so the, okay, okay, yeah. So the question is, how does multidex affect build and install times? Uh, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, and it depends on lo a lot on the way the tools work. And the tools are kind of always in flux because it's always making improvements to like dex merging. Uh, I'd say right now, as of like 1.5 uh, build tools, uh, basically with multidexing, you might actually see a build time improvement uh, because uh, that's if you're building for min SDK 21, which you can just do for development. And the reason being is that uh, all of your libraries can be separately dexed, uh, and all your modules can be separately dexed, and dex merging is super slow on the computer to the point that it's actually faster. The dex to oat step is actually faster than doing dex merging on your computer. So uh, the good thing is that multidexing build times should actually be faster, which is kind of paradox and awesome, paradoxical and awesome. Uh, install times, I think, are unaffected, you know, modulo the size of the APK for Dalvik. And on, um, on art, again, I think it's independent. It's just the size of your code in general. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>